Welcome everybody to BDO's webinar designed for professional services firms. My name is Anna Gerald and I am a tax partner focused on advising professional services firms. For those of you who don't already know, BDO is the world's fifth largest accounting network, providing auditing, advisory and taxation services in over 160 countries. So we've been long-standing advisors to the sector and our national professional services team is one of the largest dedicated sector teams in the UK accountancy firm. So through our strong sector focus, we work with a full range of clients from boutique firms to large international businesses, including partnership structures, privately owned corporates, listed and private equity backed businesses, so the full range. Our speaker today, so welcome, is Ish Binder Bedi. Ish is a chartered tax advisor specialising in VAT and has over 15 years of experience at advising clients on international and domestic VAT matters and regularly supports a range of professional services firms. So we're in touch regularly with um, Ish on very broad matters. So within the hour that we have with you, we'll be covering a really large range of VAT matters from recent legislation changes and HMRC updates to VAT case law. And we'll also be covering very topical subjects around changes to the option to tax of properties and also VAT on construction services. So plenty to get through. So as always, we're running this webinar live. And so encourage you to ask questions during the, during the, the webinar. Uh, the Q&A feature is at the top of your screen, I hope, somewhere on your screen. Um, and we'll be picking up as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar, or if time doesn't permit, after this session. So please do get in touch. So as always, again, we'll be finishing within the hour and we'll share with you the slides and also a link to the recording within a few days. So without further ado, Ish, over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to bring up was Revenue Customs Brief 522, uh, picking up on VAT group registrations and applications. So as a lot of you probably have experienced at the moment, there are a number of delays with HMRC at the moment in terms of processing applications particularly. We've seen some VAT grouping applications take between three, four, even five months to, to complete and HMRC have had to issue some guidance to give some, some clarity as to what to do in the interim whilst you're waiting for these applications to be processed. Um, they did provide some and they've had to rescind that and replace it with this. Uh, now it's worth noting this was issued in the first half of last year and they were hoping for this matter to be, be addressed within a few months, but obviously it's still an ongoing issue. Um, and principally what HMRC have noted is, is that if you are, uh, if you have supply, submitted a VAT grouping application, uh, you should treat it as if it's provisionally been accepted on the date in which you submitted it online or the date that you think HMRC would have accepted it or has received it by post. And as a result, account for VAT accordingly. So that's obviously welcome. It, it clarifies the position that you're meant to be taking whilst you're waiting. And I think that is also quite useful if you already have a VAT group in place, because it basically says, well, treat it as if you have that, have you, you've added another member if you need to, or remove that member where, where you need to. But there can be issues, particularly where you are setting up a brand new VAT group and you haven't got a VAT group number already. Um, in those situations, what do you do? Do you, you can't then file or issue uh, invoices with the correct VAT number. And if you're waiting five, six months, obviously that can potentially create a, a bit of an issue. Also, um, you would be in situations where if you're not filing your VAT returns because you're waiting for your VAT group registration to come through, you're going to be getting assessment letters and, and, uh, and requests for payment from HMRC. That obviously will uh, continue to be received, although HMRC do say that you can ignore those letters. What I would say in those situations, if you are receiving those letters, is obviously worth giving HMRC a call, let them know that a VAT grouping application is pending and you are just following HMRC guidance on this matter whilst you're waiting for a response. Uh, and so it, fundamentally, it, it's still business as usual, but there are a number of points to, to, to think about. Um, so as we set, said, setting up a, 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 a VAT group, there have been a number of instances we've seen with businesses submitting and continue to submit their VAT registration, uh, for, uh, VAT returns rather, for uh, their single VAT registrations whilst they wait for a VAT group 
that sounds reasonable because obviously you're trying to continue to pay VAT, you can continue trying to be compliant with your VAT, with your VAT returns. However, it does result in a slight issue from HMRC's perspective in that they um, their systems have issues with you trying to backdate a VAT grouping application if you have already submitted a VAT return for a period in which you're meant to be back grouped. So there is a slight issue there that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, and Anish, what, what sort of other practical points does this mean for the actual client? Um, so the, the delay that it's causing? Yeah, so th there's, there's two aspects to that. One, I'd say there's obviously the commercial factor. So you have to think about it from perspective of a client relationship where you might be billing and you're waiting for a, a VAT number, you can't issue a VAT invoice, which basically means that you would typically issue a pro forma invoice and uh, and that creates a cash flow issue for your customer if they can recover the VAT. At this point, they can't recover anything because they haven't got a valid VAT invoice to prove that they should be able to, to recover, any, uh, recover any VAT. Now, if that's over a 30 day period, that, that's manageable. But then when you start talking about five, six months to, to get that, then that starts to build up and obviously that can cause a bit of a strain. So there is a, a point there. And we, we have seen a number of situations where commercially VAT grouping is administratively simpler for a supplier, but they've decided against it because they're aware of the delays that they're, they're facing. Wow. Also, there is, a, uh, there is also a point to, to mention about um, the technical aspect of it as well. So there can be a situation where actually VAT grouping isn't necessarily just for an administrative simplification, it's to deal with a large transaction or intercompany financing that you want to manage and without necessarily creating some sort of partial exemption issue. And in those situations, obviously VAT grouping can be useful, but the date in which you set up the VAT group is essential. Um, now, if some businesses consider they're doing the right thing and submitting their VAT returns whilst they're waiting, and they then don't realize that HMRC are then potentially going to bring forward the registration date or the back group registration date, that in itself can also create an issue. Uh, so there is a piece there around communication, both from the people who are preparing the VAT return and people who might be thinking a bit more strategically about your VAT affairs and your tax affairs and any sort of transactions that might be occurring to basically make sure that both are in line and, and one's not going to cause an issue for the other. Right. Um, next slide, please. So the next change that we wanted to bring up were the removal of was the removal of default surcharge and the um, putting in place of a new penalty regime both for the late filing and late payment of VAT returns. So this is all effective for VAT periods starting on or after 1st of January 2023. So you may recall prior to that the default surcharge applied which would levy or would give you a 12 month warning for your first default and then would trigger a penalty, uh, a percentage based penalty based on uh, the number of defaults that you had incurred that had been incurred in that warning period. It, it had its benefits, it all had, also had its issues. So for example, if you're a payment trader uh, and you were just a day late, you could very well trigger penalties worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. And in fact, there have been cases where um, taxpayers have come back and said this is just not fair because of the value of the penalty relative to the nature of the default. So it's been, it's that, that's been now scrapped and we've got two different penalties. If we cover off the late submission penalty first, that's now a points-based regime uh, which will, it, you would accrue points for each breach, so i.e. each late filing, and a, a £200 fixed penalty can be applied if you breach a penalty threshold or a point threshold in this case. And that threshold will depend on the regularity of your filing over the course of a year. So if you are filing quarterly, your threshold is four points. And if you're filing monthly, that threshold is five points. Now the late payment penalty has, um, has also changed and it gives a bit of leeway, but also increases the level of the penalty depending on how late you are in your payment. It's also worth noting that you can trigger a penalty on your first default, uh, because obviously it's now focused on the length of time it takes for you to make a payment to HMRC. So, and, and on top of that, there are two charges or potentially two penalties that can be applicable in this situation. So the first charge, if you have a, a payment within zero and 15 days of the deadline, there won't be any penalty. So there is already a bit of leeway in that situation. If you have a 
an amount outstanding between day 16 and days 30, there's a 2% penalty for what's outstanding. And then any amount left outstanding from day 31, then the 2% of what is due from day 15 plus 2% of what is due at day 30. Now that's the first charge. Second charge would potentially be payable from day 31, and that accrues on a daily basis uh, at currently a 4% penalty rate. So there are effectively two points. That, so as I mentioned, that, that penalty can effectively scale up as you go, and you can trigger that on your first, on your first, um, on your first default. Uh, wow. Next slide, please. Now, what's the impact? Obviously, there's some positives and negatives to that. So like I mentioned, you can trigger a penalty from your first default now. Um, but it does give you a bit of leeway to uh, to make a payment uh, in good time if you can within say two weeks. Also, in terms of the points based system for the late filing, uh, you will need to uh, pass a test of good compliance if you want to bring your point score down to nil. And that uh, test of good compliance depends on your filing position again. So if you file on a quarterly basis, you need to maintain good compliance for 12 months, which means you have to maintain good compliance for four returns. And if you're filing monthly, then that period of good compliance is six months and six returns. Got it. Okay. So points definitely don't make prizes in this uh, in this situation. No, fine. Okay. But it generally looks quite positive for taxpayers. Is that is that right? Or have I got that wrong? Yeah. Yeah. It, it generally... Is. So it's, it, it presents a more, if you can pay on time, obviously great. If you need a bit more time, then there's not going to be a huge penalty that's going to be triggered as a result. Now, there are some, some, like, uh, some issues. So repayment traders before would no longer, uh, pre previously would not actually trigger any penalty. But now they can get a late filing penalty if they, if they breach their, their points threshold. Also, before... The issue that we had was with the default surcharge, there was uh, no scope to reduce the penalty. It was an all or nothing penalty. And like I mentioned, you could be in situations where you're triggering a penalty worth hundreds of thousands for just being a couple of days late. Uh, that's now gone as well. So yeah, it obviously scales up and it gives you time to try to get your affairs in order and actually quite frankly, speak to HMRC. So in situations where you need to agree a time to pay arrangement, you know, it promotes you having that discussion with HMRC in advance to kind of, to try to deal with that. So yeah, there's, there's positives and negatives, but I think broadly it is more positive than, than negative. Got it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, another development that we wanted to pick up on from a brief that HMRC released was around the de definition of business and non-business from a VAT perspective. This is obviously really important for VAT because it determines whether something is within the scope of VAT, whether a company or an entity needs to register. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fundamental. Now, HMRC's assessment of determining whether you're in business was previously uh, based on what we call the Lord Fisher test. Uh, and this was a case that was pretty old now. Uh, which was focused on uh, Lord Fisher, who went on a hunt and um, looked to get some compensation from some of his friends that were, that he had organised that hunt for. Uh, and HMRC assessed, arguing that they that he was in business and therefore tried to register him for VAT. Now that case set out a number of principles that you had to then apply to determine whether someone could be seen as in business or not, and that had been the key test and the foundation of the in business assessment by HMRC for a number of years. Now, moving on from that, there had been a number of cases, uh, Longbridge on the Thames, Wakefield College, that really looked at that assessment and determined that actually you needed a much more objective test that needed to be determined and need to be applied so that you had consistency. Uh, and some of these cases came out maybe 10 years ago, but HMRC's guidance has now been updated to reflect that change. So now we have a two-stage test, and that is to look at uh, two key questions. Firstly, is the activity uh, for a supply of goods or services in return for consideration? That's the first test. So basically, are you providing goods and services in return for something? And secondly, is there a supply being made for the purpose of actually trying to obtain income therefrom? I.e., are you trying to re obtain remuneration as a result of your activity? Now that sounds like, like it's quite similar, but there are two different things that you could be doing there. Obviously you could very well be providing something 
in return for consideration, but then you also then need to consider, well, am I actually doing this to try to generate income? Uh, like I said, this is obviously all established on case law that's been around for a number of years, but this is now just bringing HMRC's position up to date with that. So what, what, is, the what is the impact of this? Well, obviously, if, if there have been assessments that have been determined based on the old rules and the law, old Lord Fisher test, then that really needs to be revisited to understand whether that was based on subjective criteria, based on what you think the intention of the supplier was, what you think the, um, what you think the customer might be receiving, and really looking at these two tests and, and considering whether you think it might apply and whether you might be seen as in business. Now that can apply in a number of situations. So for example, if a holding company had been put in place and you consider that uh, it was not in business based on the old rules and therefore a VAT registration wasn't required, that might need to be looked at now based on the new test. If, for example, you have a business non-business apportionment around your VAT recovery based on the old test, again, you might need to look at whether that has changed based on the new test that HMRC has flagged in their guidance. And if you had previous, previous rulings or a position taken, again, does that need to be addressed and looked at? Because HMRC do specifically say that the old test is no longer applicable and you really do need to be focusing on, on what this new test is saying. Well, okay, so everybody actually does need to review the position. That's that's the guidance. Okay. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, and we've seen a number of businesses that have set it out or set out a position based on, for example, a holding company where um, there was some loan activity, but it was it was not really something that was actually pursued, or there was um, treasury activity where again there were gains being received but it was not really being received on with the purpose of gen, trying to generate remuneration yeah. that can be quite confusing particularly if you're accidentally making gains mm -hmm. uh, and this, that's just one example where this could potentially come up so again it's worth looking at your overall structure what your VAT registration position is and actually is anything reliant on being considered to be in business or not uh, and then reflecting on what this new test is okay yeah. uh, Next slide, please. Yeah. So moving into uh, case law, and the first case I wanted to pick up on was Ince Gordon Dad's LLP, which was primarily looking at uh, transaction costs, and in this case, fundraising costs. Now, the reason why I wanted to raise this, and I think we, we raise this on every webinar, is that uh, transaction costs is, is, is an area of focus for HMRC and is always a new case on it each year. Uh, this one was looking at fundraising. So uh, Workgroup PLC, PLC or WG was looking at fundraising to uh, buy a potential target. It incurred significant costs as a result of that. So legal costs, due diligence costs, et cetera, et cetera, as you may typically incur as part of a transaction. Um, it had an intention to join a VAT group upon, upon making its acquisition. And in this case, it was the appellant in Scorn Dad. That's LLP. So it incurred a bunch of costs, made the acquisition, it joined the VAT group with Inscorn and Dads on the date of the acquisition. And then uh, the VAT group looked to recover the VAT that, that WG had incurred on its fundraising costs. Now HMRC reviewed this and rejected the recovery, arguing that WG just did not have any intention to make taxable supplies at the time of the transactions. And that the background facts were aligned to uh, another decision, a key case called BAA, which was basically, uh, which was actually found to be similar in principle. The only real difference here, though, was that uh, WG had an intention to join the back group uh, prior to making the acquisition, whereas in BAA, that acquisition was not, uh, that, well, that evidence was not available. Now, WG tried to argue that it could recover VAT on the basis that uh, it was part of a back group and all the supplies made to and by the VAT group were treated as being made by the representative member, in this case, the appellant. Therefore, it was allowed VAT recovery. It also mentioned that the fundraising cost that, uh, that or the fundraising that it incurred was one, to, to purchase a, a, a target, but also to utilize working capital to help fund the business, to help operate the business and, and grow the business more generally. So trying to make a link to the activities of the appellant as a whole. However, the first tier tribunal looked at the uh, position and made it clear that there, uh, sorry, if you can move on to the next slide. 
uh, the courts held that actually the fundraising costs that were incurred were irrecoverable uh, because it related to non-business activity. Now, some of the key takeaways from this case was that the uh, the, court, that the WG did not intend to any actual business activity at the time that the VAT was charged, and therefore it couldn't necessarily argue that it had a basis to recover that VAT because it couldn't evidence that it intended to make uh, to undertake a taxable activity with that. The, the tribunal did note the point that uh, the fundraising or the, uh, the funds that were generated were potentially going to be used for working capital for the business and to help to grow the business, but they could not see any actual evidence of that. All they could see was evidence that the funds were going to be used to make purchases of businesses. Uh, and they also noticed that uh, just because an entity is part of a VAT group, if those costs are for a non-business purpose, that does not justify VAT recovery. So it, this is a point that's been highlighted in HMRC internal manuals. It's been confirmed now in the first tier tribunal as well. Just merely joining a VAT group does not allow you VAT recovery. What you need to be able to do is establish that there is a link between the cost being incurred and supplies being made by the VAT group as a whole. Now, in this case, there was no evidence around that in terms of the working capital. So implications. Again, another case just focusing on transaction costs and VAT recovery, and it, it is really important if you're going to be entering into a transaction to consider that recovery position, either because of uh, understanding if there's scope to mitigate potential cost, or at the very least to be aware of potential costs so you can budget accordingly. Yeah, and actually there's just been so much change in this area, you know, there seems to be case law after case law, as you say. What, what do professional services firms like do about that because keeping on top of all of those changes but some of these numbers can be so large yeah. so so yeah. what's your sort of practical advice to people yeah it's, it's it's a good point and i'd say the practical point is as soon as you kind of catch wind of there being a potential transaction or or cost being incurred i think an initial discussion with with your vast advisor or your finance team is is is, is vital here now in a number of situations you know contracts might be in draft and so it's un so understanding what the VAT recovery position is from that uh, and whether actually that's the right answer or not. It's easy to, it's, obviously I appreciate from my perspective, it's easy to say, yes, speak to someone as, as quickly as you can, you know, when you're going to have lots of competing deadlines, lots of, lots of time pressure on you. But an initial discussion can go a long way as to understanding what the impact is. And at the very least, if, if the position is that VAT is irrecoverable, okay, you can then deal with that. You can budget it, budget it accordingly. Or if there are steps that you can take to, to manage that, there, can, there are a number of steps. Because like you say, um, there's been a lot of case law and there will be continuing even more case law on this matter because the, uh, I wouldn't say the goalpost shifts to basically be as clear on the recovery position as possible, but there's always something new that has to be considered. So whether it's around the value of the charges, the substance of the company incurring the costs, et cetera, a number of considerations are really required, but that can be summarised quite quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, so best advice is to make sure that the people that are making these sorts of decisions are aware that this is a question that should be asked quite early on, um, exactly. and then make sure that you get all of the relevant points on the table to understand what you're getting into. Um, and, and you know, if there are some facts that need to be just demonstrated in a very specific way to help the reader understand what it is, then you can structure it in that way as well. So, there's there's a couple of things to do. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. So the next case that we wanted to pick up on was uh, Gray and Farrar, which it looks like we're talking about matchmaking services here. So what's the potential application? But there is uh, quite a lot here for professional services firms to, to, to think about and unpick. So Gray and Farrar provided matchmaking services uh, and quite high valued matchmaking services. So their, their fees could be anywhere between 10 to 100,000 pounds. Um, and they guaranteed their customers at least eight introductions in a year. Uh, and and in, by introductions, they mean swapping telephone numbers and, and, and introducing a, an actual, uh, actual conversation. Now, they did not charge VAT on supplies to non-EU based individuals uh, and did charge VAT on, uh, on services to EU based individuals. And it's, it's worth noting, this was looking at assessments dating back to 2016. So they were looking at place supply rules that were pre-Brexit. Post-Brexit, that assessment would be based on 
on uh, UK or non-UK principles for BTC supplies. Um, HMRC, however, disagreed with their assessment, arguing that the supply was a general B2C rule service and therefore subject to UK VAT. Uh, and it should be noted, obviously, in this situation, if you're providing B2C services of consultancy, then if the, uh, and if the individual was based overseas, then uh, UK VAT wouldn't be applicable, it would be outside the scope. So hence, hence dispute with HMRC. Now, the question was, would the services qualify as consultancy or another type of service? Uh, Gray and Farrar lost at the first tier tribunal, but then they won at the upper tier. And the, court, the case was then referred to the Court of Appeal. It's worth noting that in the upper tier tribunal, they won because the, the upper tribunal noticed that it was consultancy services and that the predominant element was consultancy. Therefore, the whole supply had to be treated as consultancy. So next slide, please. However, the Court of Appeal ruled against the taxpayer and actually said that this was an introductory service and therefore not consulting. As a result, it has to be subject to UK VAT based regardless of the customer's location because the basic B2C place supply rule would be where the supplier is based. Now, as part of the decision, and, and this is the main things that I think we need to, un to unpick, uh, the Court of Appeal highlighted a tier of assessments when determining whether something is a single or multiple supply. Uh, and from that, there's effectively the key one is uh, what is the predominant element? So of, of your various supplies, which would you say is the main supply being provided? From there, then there's another test that can be applied as to whether the other services being provided are ancillary to that. But then they mentioned that that is a uh, in itself an ancillary test because the main one should be whether you can determine if there's a predominant element. And then beyond that, there's the overarching test, which is the view that, that you might be able to create a distinct single supply uh, from a mixture of the services that you're providing. And that was effectively the third tier. So if you don't meet any of the first two, that's when you start looking at that. They also started looking at whether uh, a, the supply could be qualified as consultancy. And they held that really for something to be a, a consultant service, it had to be principally and habitually provided by consultants. Now, there wasn't really much opinion or, or discussion around that, but I think that's potentially helpful in terms of giving a view as to how you would define something to be consulting or not. Mm -hmm. So what's the implications? Again, here it's really understanding if you're providing B2C services to non-UK customers, you really need to understand what the place of supply rule is and whether you think it qualifies as a consulting service or something else, obviously, because then that will drive the VAT treatment. Beyond that, also, you need to then understand, are you providing a range of different services? Are you providing a single service? And actually, how does that fit in with this case law? And actually, quite frankly, other case law around single and multiple supplies, uh, because obviously this is suggesting that there is a tier or there are more important tests than others. Uh, and that may not necessarily be consistent with other, with, with um, with other case law. Mm. So it's a number of key points for people to take away. Is there, is there anything else that you would pull out in relation to this case, that particular point around making sure that you understand what the lead service is effectively? But is there anything else? Yeah, so so that that is the key. I think there's, there's a number of things to, to, to think about here, which is that tier of cases in term, or the tier of tests, I should say, around, uh, around determining whether something's a single supply or not. That is useful, but in itself does present a bit of an issue, a bit of a challenge, because there are other cases or other tests that you might need to potentially apply. So, for example, um, there is clear CJU law that says you start by treating supplies as separate. You don't start by treating them as a single supply. You also have to look at whether there is a single indivisible supply of services being provided for which it is artificial to split. You know, th these are other tests or other kind of considerations that are required, and that becomes really important to then gauge because this case is important and is binding, but we also have other binding case laws. So what takes precedent here, precedence here? And that, that's really vital, particularly if you're a large taxpayer and you can potentially fall under uncertain tax treatment, where you might have these difference, difference in, in definitions or, or views or tests. 
then could you get to one conclusion by one test and another conclusion by another test, both are contained in HMRC's manuals and guidance and case law, what do you apply and, and, and do you then therefore potentially fall foul of, of uncertain tax tre treatment reporting rules just because of this inconsistency in, in, in case law? So, mm -hmm. so there is quite a lot to consider. There is obviously the, the, the guidance on, on consulting services and how you define that, but there is there's a lot here that I would say um, needs to be unpicked. If you have a broad range of services being provided to individuals, I think the key here is understanding what you're providing. Do you qualify under Gray and Farrar in terms of what is the predominant element and actually looking at, is there anything else that might be inconsistent with that view? Got it, yeah. Next slide, please. So another case that we wanted to pick up on as well was Berlin Chemie. So this was looking at fixed establishments. Now, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see I've defined what a fixed establishment is because uh, the concept of establishment from that perspective is different from a direct tax perspective. And a fixed establishment is any establishment other than the business establishment, in this case, the principal, um, the principal office or, or place of business characterized by a sufficient degree of permanence and a suitable structure in terms of human and technical resources to enable it to receive and use services supplied to it for its own needs. So that can be, for example, a branch structure that you might have. It can also be uh, through third party, potentially third party resources. But we wanted to pick this up because we, we know, you know a lot of professional services firms will either have a branch structure overseas or may well have a network of subsidiaries or member firms that they may want to, uh, to, to utilize to provide services to their customers. Now, in this situation, we had a company in Romania that was set up by the parent company in Germany. This uh, Romanian company was, was uh, set up to provide marketing, advertising and regulatory services to the parent, and that was on a cost plus basis. Now, because the subsidiary was based in Romania and the parent was based in Germany. The, treat, the, the invoices were treated as subject to the reverse charge and therefore the parent effectively accounted for that as an input and output in Germany. However, the Ro Romanian tax authorities looked at this arrangement and argued that the German, tax, the German uh, parent had uh, a fixed establishment in Romania. Uh, and that was through the human and technical resources of its subsidiary. So the question that was that was sent to the CJAU was whether having uh, an immediate and permanent access to the human and technical resources of a subsidiary or affiliated company would be sufficient to create a fixed establishment for that purposes or whether it wouldn't be. Next slide, please. And the CJAU uh, ruled in favor of the taxpayer in this case uh, and actually held that uh, the same resources cannot be used to basically make and receive the supply in question. So again, to, to unpick this case, there's a number of key things to, to, to think about. So the first point was that the CJU reinforced the point that you don't have to own human and technical resources in another member state to effectively trigger a fixed establishment. So you can have third party resources and you can have uh, other group company resources in another territory and tr potentially trigger a fixed establishment for yourself. However, it is necessary for that tax taxpayer to have the right to dispose of those human and technical resources in the same way as if they were its own. Now, in this case, however, for the Romanian tax authorities uh, view to be applicable, the same resources that made the supply of services to the German parent would also have to be the same resources that received the supply. And in that case, you're basically providing supplies to yourself, which I think the, the CJU effectively held, well, that, that doesn't necessarily present an economically real answer that you're, you're generating a supply to yourself. And so really, I think this is useful because there's been lots of case law, particularly around establishment and the interaction with uh, subsidiaries and, and third party resources. So I think this gives much clearer guidance around intercompany arrangements, and particularly where you, you might feel like there's an establishment risk it's worth looking at this case to understand how it might apply. But it does reinforce the view that saying, well, you don't need to own those resources to still tr trigger a fixed establishment. So merely setting up a subsidiary or merely utilizing third party resources doesn't automatically remove the risk of an establishment. Mm 
So if, if you are purely relying on that, then it's, it's probably worth looking at this case and looking at the case law around this subject just to make sure you're comfortable or at least assess what the risk could potentially be. And again, worth noting actually in some territories, uh, they have a much harsher or stricter view around fixed establishment than others. Obviously right now under Brexit, despite Brexit, we have the same definition from, from, a, from that perspective on fixed establishment, but other territories are much stricter or might have a, uh, uh, might have a, a, a different view on what triggers an establishment or not. So you have to, you have to look at that assessment and that risk assessment, both from the technical pers perspective from CJU case law, but also from a local perspective in terms of what is the local attitude to an establishment. Mm, OK, and so this is important for businesses that might have branches or utilise uh, resources overseas. So, you know, when uh, sort of COVID happened and everybody wanted to sort of disperse around the world, this is another um, area to, to really focus on. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Now, it shouldn't necessarily impact or this issue around using other people's resources shouldn't impact situations where, for example, you have a network of member firms where you are just subcontracting bits and pieces ad hoc as you need to. But if you are clearly relying on them, uh, you have full control over them, then that starts raising a few questions and it starts blurring the lines. And we, we've seen a number of situations where there have been fixed establishments created overseas in, in, in an EU member state. Um, and then the question comes up as to, well, who is meant to account for a supply? Who's meant to account for a purchase? It then starts getting quite confusing because you're meant to go with who is meant to be more closely connected to a supply. And particularly, for example, with legal services, you can have situations where part of supply is being dealt with by establishment A, uh, but actually it's being signed off by, by, um, by a partner in, in establishment B, who is more responsible for that supply? You know, it, it becomes it becomes very difficult to then ascertain that and trying to keep two different tax authorities happy. Yeah, yeah. And also it can be very different to direct tax um, in, in terms of what creates an establishment. So, you know, assuming that it's the same is not always the right thing to do either. So, um, yeah, lots of considerations. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to property matters. Um, these sound like this might sound like a small change, but actually it does have a number of, of uh, impacts for, for businesses. So for a summary of, of the option to tax, uh, this is effectively a notifica notification you, you can submit to HMRC where you uh, confirm that you're treating a certain property as if it's taxable. Um, typically property will, be, will fall to be exempt. Uh, and so the option to tax allows you to treat it as if it's taxable and therefore removes risks around uh, partial exemption or restrictions on impact tax recovery. Now, prior to the 1st of February, 2023, uh, you could check if notifications were valid. HMRC would review those and also confirm that they were valid and then provide you with an acknowledgement letter. They would also be willing to confirm existence of an option to tax. However, from the 1st of February, 2023, and I suspect this might be to deal with some of the backlogs that they're currently facing, they've, yeah. they've now confirmed that they're no longer going to be checking the validity. And that actually is on the business to make sure that that notification is, is correctly submitted and correct in the first in the first place. They've also said that they're not going to submit uh, acknowledgement letters. So if you're submitting an option tax by post, you're not going to get anything back from HMRC to confirm that that option tax is validly submitted or at least been, been received by HMRC. However, you can submit option tax by email now, and there will be an automated receipt email from HMRC to confirm that it's been received. So you might want to start thinking about submitting option tax via email rather than by post. Um, they've also confirmed that they're only willing to, to confirm the existence of an option tax in limited circumstances. And that's typically in situations where your own records are, um, or where this, the option tax might be beyond six years, so beyond your record retention requirements. Now, option tax are really important, particularly when you're dealing with, with transactions or a TOGC or a share sale. Um, and particularly with the TOGC, uh, as we'll move on to on the next slide. So, yeah, evidence of option tax is really vital. If you're involved in a share disposal or share purchase, you're obviously buying the whole company. If there's a property portfolio or property there, you need to understand if you have a, if there is a valid option tax in that company or not to then be able to work out what you're meant to be doing from a VAT perspective 
on any purchases or obviously on your supplies. If you're involved in a TOGC or a share and asset deal, the option tax is really vitally important because there are specific conditions around opted property in which you are required yeah, as the buyer to also opt if the seller has opted to tax property in order for the property to qualify as part of the TOGC. Or if they don't qualify as a TOGC, then the VAT treatment of the property is really important because then VAT is potentially applicable on it if, if the option tax is applied or not. So what really do businesses need to do? Well, you need to choose to know choose the way in which you want to notify HMRC. Like I say, it might be recommended that you submit by email to at least get the receipt from HMRC. Um, record keeping is going to be absolutely vital now, uh, as it always should be, but good record keeping is going to be really important. You're going to want to make sure that you have uh, the email of the submission to HMRC showing the notification. You're going to want to make sure you keep the email of receipt from HMRC to be able to show to other people where necessary that you've that it's been received by HMRC. And I would also suggest if there's any analysis around confirming that the notification notification is valid. So for example, around timelines and whether the notification has been made before a tax point, that that's also documented as well. So again, really important here uh, because HMRC will not necessarily be able to confirm anything for you. Yeah, so seemingly quite small changes there, Ish, but um, probably quite significant impact when you come to do a transaction or if there's an issue. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Uh, and particularly from a property perspective, obviously it's high value matters, right? So if you don't know what the option tax position is, that could have a big impact on how much VAT is potentially chargeable, how much is recoverable, and that could be worth a significant amount. Yeah. Um, so as a general point, you know, record keeping vital, maintain an option to tax register. Like I say, if there's any uncertainty around whether notification is valid, I would also recommend making some sort of note around that and keeping that on file so that you can then refer to that in if you have to look at it because the option tax can last for years and years that you have that on file so you can reflect back on that if you need to. Um, and yeah, also consider what the option tax position is as early as you can in, in regards to any transaction so that that any matters around that or any uncertainty around that can be dealt with as soon as possible to avoid transaction delays. Uh, next slide. And then finally, we want to pick up on the domestic reverse charge for construction services. So again, Im immediately the question sounds, well, why would we care if we're talking about professional services? And given that this was introduced in 2021, we're starting to see how HMRC are dealing with this um, and, and issues we are seeing in practice. This is obviously gonna, gonna impact on professional services firms where you're dealing with a contractor, might be for your office, might be for other reasons, might be um, architects firms, for example, might be dealing with contractors as well as part of a design and build. There's a number of different reasons why it's gonna be, be, be relevant. So if we move on to the next slide. So under normal rules, if a contractor was providing services to the customer, they would just charge VAT. Uh, and the customer would then recover that VAT based on their recovery position. Under domestic reverse charge rules, however, if there were construction services being provided, which qualified, i.e. they qualified as construction services and under the CIS regime, and you provided those to a, a customer who were VAT registered, uh, then they would not charge VAT on their invoice. They would reference the reverse charge, and then the customer would self account for the reverse charge, i.e. they would account for the input and output tax. On the, on the supply. In that situation, um, the reason why this has been introduced is to try to combat tax fraud or VAT fraud in particular in the construction industry. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's a, a measure that needs to be dealt with. Now, the one exception or the main exception in regards to this is around situations where that customer is in fact an end user. In that situation, if you are the end user and you notify in writing to the supplier before receiving those supplies that you are an end user, then the contractor can charge VAT and then normal rules will apply. So in that situation, you would recover the VAT in accordance with normal rules. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what are we then seeing in practice? Well, there's a number of issues. First and foremost, notifications aren't always being provided in writing. And as I kind of mentioned previously around the option to tax, the key here is around record keeping and being able to evidence around uh, the steps that you had taken. Now, if you don't necessarily have that evidence and you haven't got that on file, then 
if a contractor has charged you VAT on the basis that you're an end user, but there's no evidence of you confirming that you are an end user, then HMRC can say that that VAT has been incorrectly charged. And actually the domestic reverse charge should apply, even though you are in practice, the end user. Uh, now, what is the impact of that? Because obviously if you're accounting for, uh, for input tax, or the alternative would be you account for input tax and output tax, well, H1C would say that VAT has been incorrectly charged and therefore assess you for incorrectly charged input tax, but then also potentially charge penalties and interest as a result of that. And penalties, if it's a careless error, can be up to 30%. So what should businesses be doing in this situation? Again, it's really understanding what the position is with your contractors uh, and seeing and understanding whether the, the services that are being received qualify under CIS and whether they qualify as construction services and therefore under the domestic reverse charge. Do you have an end user notification? Is it applicable? Uh, and have you explicitly made one? You know, something by email should be fine. But if you haven't made one, if you're not sure if you've made one, you then need to then start thinking about in terms of the, the contractor's costs, is that VAT correctly recoverable? Is there a potential exposure? Do you need to make some sort of correction to HMRC? Because obviously it make more sense to preempt a disclosure and to submit one on a voluntary basis on an unprompted basis rather than a, on a prompted basis. Uh, and in, in there, so it's worth looking at your contracts. So some people don't necessarily realize that uh, standard terms with some contractors might already have an end user notification in the terms and conditions already. So when you sign, you effectively give your end user notification. But if you have different contracts with different contractors, um, there is scope for inconsistency. There's therefore scope to, to, for, for risk because obviously you don't know if you've got the, the same terms in each contract. So really understanding that, understanding your records and really have, making sure that the finance team is made aware of any sort of building work or any contractors or any construction services that might be received so that steps can be taken to protect the firm. Uh, and maintain the, the relevant audit trail so that if H1C do raise a question that you'll have the right files on hand to be able to, to bat away any sort of questions around the, the recovery of any VAT. And with that, we are at the end of our presentation. Brilliant, thanks Ish. Just, just one question just on that last point around mm -hmm. the, the reverse charge piece. So, so the, I think what you're saying is that there are risks for sort of the end user, if you like, the business even if they incur the, the construction costs of their own business, if they haven't had the correct notifications given. So um, in terms of what the tax teams or the finance teams can do about that is making sure that they know what's going on again, looking at those contracts, if it's not in there, doing something about it. So it's, it's being proactive and, and, and sort, of, uh, sort of being aware that there's activity going on that could fall within this category. Yeah, pre precisely. And I think there's the, the problem with VAT is that it's a transactional tax which then requires you to have discussions with sales teams, with, with logistics teams, with, um, with yeah, uh, fee earners around, around their VAT, VAT determination. With this, obviously, it's, it's really trying to understand and link in with the people who might be dealing with procurement and dealing with, with purchases of contract, uh, construction costs. So that may not necessarily be on finance's agenda or, or the tax team's agenda. So mm -hmm. this is something where you it may not ordinarily come to your attention and so actually it's basically making sure you've got the right controls in place so that if something does come up you can preempt that and you can before you start receiving invoices make sure if an end user notification is required that that's submitted or that if a standard term for example that you might want to include in your contract needs to be included that that's also included so yeah it, it, it's, a, it's a general point around basically making sure um, you're well linked in with other parts of the business because yeah. it's not necessarily a, a typical area that you would expect the finance team to be linked into. Yeah, no, understood. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that, Ish. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. And so if anyone's got any more, then please do send them through. Um, so you touched on quite a few areas there. And so going back to the, the Gray and Farrar case. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a focus on single versus multiple supply points. But I thought the definition of consultancy services was important particularly for professional services firms. Could you provide a bit more detail on this? Yep, yep. So um, it, it, it's worth noting that the upper tribunal went into a bit more of an analysis around consulting services uh, and how you might define something to qualify as a consulting service. 
the Court of Appeal obviously has has is, is has taken precedence, and it it has referred to uh, consultancy as consisting of advice that is principally and habitually provided by a consultant, uh, and that that advice is effectively based on a high degree of expertise. Uh, now, in terms of that assessment, that's the that there is about a few lines in in the Court of Appeal decision uh, clarifying that. Uh, and the Court of Appeal held that uh, the there was no real dispute around that, and and they and they themselves agreed with that definition. So they moved beyond uh, they moved beyond that and just focused on the single multiple supply point. But what you do have is that definition. Then, so is something principally and habitually provided by a consultant? Does it consist of advice? Does it consist of advice that uh, for which there is a high degree of expertise? Now. Previously, HMRC, I think, were focused on consultancy qualified as something provided by the, uh, I'm going to put these in inverted commas, um, liberal professions is, is how, they, how, how they kind of qualified it before. This, you would argue, potentially expands on that and gives you the kind of key test you need to think about, like I mentioned, how I've broken that down into those three stages. So I think that is helpful. Um, but again, there's, there's subjective subjectivity there. So understanding what you think might be principally provided by someone, uh, by a consultant, what might be seen as as expertise. You know, in Graham Farrar's case, this person did have expertise. They did have um, matchmaking experience. They provided advice and support in result of that. It's just that people were quite clearly contracting to receive a number of introductions each year and that had to override everything else so i do think that that is helpful at the very least to then start thinking about if you are obviously looking at it from a b2c perspective you'll want to then think about how you would define something to be consulting because obviously the risk being that uh, a supply of of services hmrc would argue would be subject to uk VAT rather than being outside the scope yeah. Um, but yeah those are the kind of three key tests that i think came out of the court of appeal decision yeah yeah, and then sorry, that outside the scope point is is relevant if people are not in the UK, if the end users That's are right. in the UK. Yep. Yeah. So 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 pre Brexit, it was non EU. EU. Um, if you are providing the consulting services to an individual based or an, an entity that's not in business based uh, outside the EU, post Brexit, yeah. that's now just non UK. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, and then the second question is that you mentioned the case around transaction costs. Could you highlight the key points that continue to be considered by HMRC when determining if VAT is recoverable? So a recap, I guess, on some of those cases that you talked about. Yeah, so um, I think you can fundamentally summarise that into two questions, really. Um, the first point is, who is the recipient of the service? Uh, and this is something that's been determined by uh, by decision in, in air tours. So, so, so fundamentally, in order to work out whether someone's a recipient or not, you have to determine whether they are owed a duty of care. So you can be in a situation where there's a tripartite agreement, for example, so a contract between three parties. One party might merely just be on there just to pay for the service. One party is owed a duty of care, uh, is you know the invoice, uh, so rather the, I should say the deliverable contract is effectively in their name. Now in that situation, the air tours would say you'd have to treat the entity that is owed a duty of care as the recipient of the service so just because you're paying for a supply that doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you've received it so that's the first point that needs to be considered the second point then is once you've worked out who the recipient is it's whether that recipient is using those costs for the purposes of uh, an activity that allows you to recover VAT and this is effectively what was being picked up by INSCO and Gordon Dad, uh, which was suggesting that uh, the that WG, i.e. The, the acquirer, Bidco, did not have an economic activity that allowed it to recover VAT because it was trying to rely on the activity of the VAT group as a whole. Um, now, that test and that assessment has been subject to even more case law, and, and it's something that is constantly being looked at. So, like I mentioned, once you've worked that out in terms of who the recipient is, you then need to look at, all right, well, well, what is this? What what activity is this company providing? Does it undertake a business activity? Yes, no. Does that business activity allow it to recover VAT? I.e., is it providing some VAT exempt services, which restricts its VAT recovery, or is it providing taxable services? In 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 the majority of cases, that's going to be management charges. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, there's been 
further case law around whether those entities are in business or not. So to take a look at uh, the substance of the of the of the business. So does it have the right substance to be able to provide the services to provide management services or the support services that, that it needs to provide? Um, are the contracts set up in a way that's commercially feasible? I.e., are the fees charged reasonable? Are they charged with regularity? Are you are you billing like on on a regular basis? Are you um, is there an obligation to to make payment? So we've seen situations where, for example, payments are are contingent on profitability, in which case HMRC have won cases to say, well, if it's wholly contingent on profitability, then you can't argue that the management company is act is really acting in business. Um, so the, yeah, there's, there's lots of things to, to to think about, and and that piece, particularly on the economic activity piece and the ability to recover that, that in particular is always constantly under investigation and under further scrutiny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Ish, thank you. Um, we've come to the end of the questions and the the webinar, and so thank you very much for all of the points that you've made. I think there's some fundamental um, aspects in all of that. Big numbers at stake as well. So you know the, the warnings around documentation making decisions and documenting why or notifications etc just is, is throughout the whole of what you've just been through so I think that's there's some key points in there for our audience so thank you for that so thank just you. to remind everybody um, we will be circulating the slides and the recording um, and there's plenty to go back on I'm sure if people want to sort of revisit the points you've made as, as I say there's a lot in there so thank you everyone for listening I uh, hope you have a lovely day and we will see you soon at the next webinar Thank you very much, everybody.